All right, let's get started. Um, as we still have some people joining in, but in the next few minutes, we'll have most of the people in the room for today's event. Hi, everyone. My name is Nari, and I'm with the Congressman's Office, and I'll be moderating today's conversation. Before we begin, I am just going to go over a few key details. On the agenda for today, the Congressman will start with opening remarks, and then we will go into a few frequently asked questions that were submitted beforehand. After that, we will begin our live Q&A portion. So if you would like to ask a live question to Tom today, please first ask your question using the chat feature at the bottom of your screen. Please include your name and the town you are from along with your question. This will help us call on the correct person. Make sure that you can get your question asked. Um, we ask that you uh, please limit yourself to one question. And if you do have a follow-up, please just ask again and I will cue you back up for if time allows. I will let you know when you are the next questioner and then mute you when that time comes. And I'll go over this process a few more times before we begin that. So if you missed any of those instructions, no worries. If your question is in regards to an individual issue, um, as in seeking federal casework, our office may be able to help. We can assist with accessing public benefits such as Social Security and Medicare, passports and visas, immigration and naturalization services, veterans benefits, or in resolving issues with a federal agency such as the IRS as well as much, much more. If you would like to request assistance, we ask that you please visit malinowski.house.gov slash casework. I am putting that that link into the chat feature in just a little bit. Um, we ask that you please fill out this form and a constituent service representative will reach out to you after reviewing your information. Uh, a note that this call is being recorded for distribution purposes. So if you would like to turn off your camera, please feel free to do so. And with that, I will turn it over to the Congressman for some opening remarks. Great, thank you so much, Nari. Hi, everybody, thank you for joining us today. Um, a lot going on in Washington, so I imagine you could, it will be a lot of questions about some of the bills that we're working on. Uh, and I wanna get to those as quickly as possible, but let me just offer a few reflections uh, up top. This has been a, a very, um, very strange year for all of us. Um, and certainly for those of us who have the privilege of serving in the United States Congress. Uh, I, I started the year uh, in the first week of January, sitting in the House Gallery, watching what I expected would be a ceremony, a ceremony marking the peaceful transfer of power from one leader, from one president to another, something that we have done since the beginning of the founding of the American Republic, a ceremony that, that marks um, a process that is so critical to the safety and success of our country over all of these years. And of course, you know what happened, you know what we experienced when we were sitting in that room. We didn't actually know how serious it was. We didn't see the hand-to-hand -hand combat outside uh, of the Capitol building. And we didn't fully understand in the way that we are beginning to understand now, thanks to the work of the January 6th Commission, um, just how close we came that day to losing the institutions of government that we so cherish in our country. Well, that was the beginning. That was January 6th. And here we are um, more than nine months later, and we are busy working in Congress to pass legislation to help the people that we serve. We are focused on the practical issues that we should be focused on, and we are making progress. And so you could literally say that in the last nine or 10 months, we have gone from insurrection to infrastructure. We've gone from almost losing our republic to demonstrating why it is valuable and why it deserves to be preserved and continued. So I'm really, really thrilled with where we are. Um, I wish it were a few days from now because I get to tell you about the final passage of the legislation that we're considering, but we still get to talk about the substance of it because I think we're, we're very close to where we need to be. 
And I'll just uh, go over some of the issues. Um, as many of you remember, when, um, when I ran for Congress originally, uh, I, I went out and talked to people, I held town halls and town meetings, and three of the issues that came up most often were infrastructure and particularly the need to build the gateway tunnel so that we would have a, uh, a working uh, railway connection between New Jersey and New York for another 100 years, um, the SALT deduction, the state and local tax deduction, which was taken away from us by Congress in 2017, and whether I could try to get that back for our middle class taxpayers. Um, and third, the high cost of health care. Um, this was a time when the Affordable Care Act was, uh, was being uh, 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 threatened. There was an effort to repeal it. Um, and even those who had it uh, understandably complained that it wasn't affordable enough. So on those top three issues, I, I am I'm really thrilled to be able to say that we're we're you know we're we're on the verge of keeping all of our promises that uh, that that I made to you uh, that we in the United States Congress made to you on the Gateway Tunnel and infrastructure. We're about to pass a bipartisan infrastructure bill um, that would fund construction of the entire Gateway project. Uh, we already have the support of the Biden administration. We did not have that from uh, President Biden's predecessor. Um, and the bipartisan infrastructure bill will, will fund it on top of dozens of other less famous, less high profile, but equally important um, infrastructure projects that our municipalities, our counties, and our state desperately need to build. Um, on the SALT deduction, uh, the second bill we are considering uh, hopefully this week or, or next week at the latest, uh, the Build Back Better bill um, will have a provision that will restore the SALT deduction uh, for um, particularly those middle-class homeowners who need it the most in, in states like New Jersey where our property taxes are so high. Um, and by the way, just as an aside, our property taxes right now would probably be even higher if we hadn't succeeded earlier this year in providing relief to our municipal governments, um, which were bleeding revenue uh, and had additional ex uh, expenditures due to the, the COVID pandemic. But anyway, the SALT deduction will be part of this package if we can get it across the finish line. And on healthcare costs, um, we have a provision in this bill. Uh, we actually already passed it in the American Rescue Plan uh, a few months ago that we are going to extend it for several years um, that will ensure that nobody in America has to pay more than 8.5% of their income uh, for health insurance. So for particularly, particularly those folks who had to rely on Obamacare to get their health insurance, but didn't qualify for the subsidies because their income was just a little bit too high, that already is resulting and will continue to result in huge savings on health insurance. So I'm starting there because those are three things that I ran on that I promised to do. Um, and, and I want to be able to say that, that I kept the main promises that, that I made to the people I represent. But there's so much more in these bills. On the infrastructure stuff, um, there will be a huge investment in, um, in, what, in what we call uh, climate resiliency, which is a fancy word for uh, for, for flood control, for stormwater management, for all of the water engineering projects that, that we need and that New Jersey desperately needs, particularly after uh, what we just went through with Ida, uh, to make sure that, that our homes and our properties are, are protected from the ever-growing effects of, uh, of climate change. We're going to hook up every community in America, the broadband high-speed broadband and internet. That is an issue still in some parts of my district, in some parts of, uh, of New Jersey. Uh, we're going to invest hugely in upgrading the national electrical grid so that we have fewer outages and most important, so that we can actually plug our cars uh, into outlets uh, as we increasingly drive electric cars without, uh, without crashing the grid, a critical part of our transition from fossil fuels to clean energy. Um, and then the Build Back Better bill, there's a lot more there that's going to benefit um, New Jersey. And I, I would start with uh, the need for childcare and high quality preschool for our kids, because there's nothing more important for working parents. There's nothing more important 
there's no more high impact investment we can make um, in, uh, in the success of our economy in, in the future. And what this bill will do is guarantee universal preschool, high quality preschool for every three and four year old uh, in America. Um, and it will cap the cost of childcare um, at 7% of family income. Uh, in New Jersey, if you've got two kids in, in childcare, um, you're paying an average right now about $23,000 a year. Think about that. That, that is about 35% more than the average rent in New Jersey. We're having a lot of economic disruptions right now, which I'm sure we'll talk about on this call. We have a labor shortage in this country. One of the factors is that it is prohibitively expensive um, for working parents to go to work when they're paying that amount of money to take care of their younger children. And we wanna make sure that working parents have the freedom to make that choice, whatever is best for them. And if they choose to go back to the workforce, we should have high quality and affordable childcare in this country. And we can talk a little bit more about how that might work. Um, a hugely important part of the Build Back Better bill, in fact, the, the biggest part of it in terms of the resources that we, we spend um, will be uh, an investment uh, to, to, to fight climate change. And again, to make sure that America is the country that leads the world in the transition from fossil fuels to, to clean energy. Look, we, we just got, when we were hit by, by Ida, what it brought home to me is that climate change is not some abstract threat. Climate change is four feet of water in your basement. Just as for some parts of the country, climate change is a wildfire racing down a hillside towards your house or, or a hurricane um, that, that is so strong um, that the levees break if you're living in, in the southern part of, of our country. So this is real for an increasing, a growing number of Americans. And if we do not start making the investments that we need to right now, we're not protecting the people of the United States. Um, and so in this bill, uh, there are a lot of different ideas we, tr we tried. There are a lot of complexities in getting this through the US Senate. I'm sure we will talk about that. Um, but we did come up with a package that mostly consists of tax incentives um, and credits for, uh, for both individuals, uh, homeowners, um, and for the utility sector to speed up the transition to clean energy so that we can meet the ambitious targets that President Biden uh, is pledging our country to at the climate summit in Scotland uh, this, this weekend. So that's something I'm very, very excited about. There's a lot more in the bill we can talk about. I will close by saying that um, I believe it is responsibly paid for. That's extremely important right now uh, for those of us who are concerned about the national debt, who are concerned about the potential for inflation in, uh, in our economy, uh, and who are concerned about equity. Um, I don't think there are too many people in this call, for example, who think that it's a great idea that a company like Amazon gets away with paying no taxes, um, especially uh, how much uh, the big multinational corporations depend on public taxpayer funded investments in everything from education of the workforce to the infrastructure that they need to deliver their products to our doors. Um, so you will see in the tax provisions in this bill, Nothing that affects uh, ordinary, hardworking middle class Americans, nothing that affects anyone making less than $400,000 a year, um, but quite a bit that ensures that the largest corporations actually do start paying their fair share again. Um, and so that's something I am, uh, I, I don't see that as a cost of this bill. I actually see that as, uh, as a strong benefit. Um, so those are some of the highlights. Uh, we do not solve every problem that America or the world faces in these bills. There's a great deal more that we have to do, but I think the content uh, of the legislation we're considering is 100% consistent with the issues that my constituents have raised with me on these calls. Uh, I've done more than 100 of these town halls now since I was uh, elected to, to be your representative. Um, and I also think that uh, when we're done, we are going to be able to say something else. And that is the, the government that the American people voted for is working, that we are delivering, that we are taking our promises 
seriously, whether you agree or not with everything that we are doing, this is how democracy is supposed to work. And ultimately, my goal is not just more affordable childcare, not just better transportation infrastructure, not just moving America to clean energy. My goal here is to try to restore some of the faith and confidence that the American people once had in our government, in our democratic institutions, so that we don't listen to the people who are trying to tear those institutions down, the people who are trying to divide us from one another. So with that, um, I would be uh, uh, really eager to hear your thoughts and your questions, and we'll try to get to as many as we can on this call. Marie, back to you. Thanks, Tom. All right, before we begin live questioning, we are just going to go through a few frequently asked questions that were submitted beforehand. If you pre-submitted a question and it is not asked today in our FAQ portion, please ask again in the chat feature for it to be answered live today. Just a reminder that if you would like to ask a live question, please use the chat feature at the bottom of your screen and I will add you to the list of questioners. We are already we already have a queue going, so now would be a great time to start submitting those questions as well. All right, Tom, some of these questions you may have touched on, but we just want to reiterate them for their importance. Tom, for your first pre-submitted question, where do things stand with climate policy provisions in the Build Back Better Budget Reconciliation Bill? Got it. Um, well, as I mentioned uh, in, my, uh, in my opening remarks, um, th this is going to be the biggest investment America has ever made in uh, in, in fighting climate change, and not a moment too soon for the reasons that uh, I discussed and that all of us have personally experienced in the state of New Jersey over the last several weeks. Um, there are a lot of different uh, ideas that have been put forward about the best way to do this. Um, some of them I think maybe may have been a little bit more economically efficient than the ones that we uh, that we ended up choosing. As many of you on this call no. I, I, uh, I think the, the best way to fight, fight climate change is through market mechanisms like uh, a carbon fee and dividend uh, system. Um, I'm very, I'd be very eager for us, uh, in addition to, to pricing carbon uh, within the US economy in, in a rational way, to impose in effect a carbon tax on imports to this country, on imports from countries like China, to make sure we are taking uh, into account uh, the, the, the carbon footprint of what, what China and India does uh, as they manufacture the products that they export to us. Um, we had to get 50 votes in the US Senate. Um, one of those very important for the climate discussion is Senator Joe Manchin of West Virginia, who uh, didn't like all of our ideas, but we came up with others that we think will still get us to the same ambitious goals, but in, in different ways. As I mentioned, the, the biggest emphasis in the bill is clean energy tax credits. We've got about $320 billion uh, over 10 years in, uh, in expanded tax credits uh, for utilities uh, to incentivize them to move towards reliance on, uh, on clean energy, um, better uh, tax credits for improved uh, electronic uh, electricity transmission uh, and storage, which will be absolutely critical to making this uh, transition. And also for consumers uh, who, uh, who purchase uh, uh, zero emission vehicles um, and who um, uh, upgrade their homes to be less reliant on fossil fuels, more, more reliant on, uh, on solar, geothermal, and other, other forms of, uh, of clean energy. Uh, so that's the biggest part uh, of the bill. Uh, dealing with climate. There's also, between the infrastructure bill and, and the Build Back Better bill, there's well over $100 billion of investment in climate resiliency in making sure that our homes, our communities, and our critical infrastructure are better protected from uh, the impacts uh, of climate change, and also well over $100 billion investment in research into new technologies that are going to help us beyond just the wind and solar that we have right now that are gonna help us to meet those goals. Um, are we done? Absolutely not, I, I, I sincerely hope not. Uh, I, I think we're gonna have opportunities uh, to do some things that are not in this bill. One of the drawbacks of this big bill is that it's so huge 
And when it's when you have something this big, there's always something that somebody opposes. Whereas if you take something out that's an individual discrete proposal, we might be able to get more than 50 votes actually. Um, the, the Build Back Better bill, as you know, is a partisan bill. It's a democratic bill. The infrastructure bill is bipartisan, but there may be pieces of the Build Back Better bill that we can get bipartisan support for. Um, and I think we want to spend the next year investigating uh, whether we can do that. So it's a huge step forward on climate. It's not everything that we need yet, and I'm going to keep working hard on this. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. All right, we are going to take one more FAQ, and then we will go ahead into live questioning. Tom, for your next uh, pre-submitted question, what can be done about voting rights, given it being halted in the Senate? Thank you. Actually, I just thought one more thing on, on the climate stuff that's important for New Jersey. We've got in this bill a ban on offshore oil drilling. Um, you remember there was a proposal in the last administration to open up the New Jersey shore for oil rigs. And obviously, I was against that. I think most of us would be against that. Um, so this bill, not that Biden wants to do it, but this bill would take care of that uh, should any future president want to move back in that direction. On voting rights, um, as you all know, uh, we passed in the House now two different versions of what we call HR1, uh, our voting rights and campaign finance reform bill, uh, as well as the renewal of the 1965 Voting Rights Act. These things have to go to the Senate. And once again, we, um, you know, we sometimes joke in the House that the Senate is the price we pay for having a democracy. Um, we are struggling with the, the, the various rules there that make it hard to get anything done, including, of course, the filibuster. Um, the Build Back Better bill takes advantage of this procedure called reconciliation, budget reconciliation, which allows you to pass a bill with 51 votes, but it has to be related to the budget or taxation. It can't be a bill that changes policy. Voting rights can never go through under budget reconciliation rules. And so we have to deal with the filibuster. Um, so the strategy has been um, to try to negotiate a version of that bill that at least um, all of the Democrats, all 50 Democrats, including Senator Manchin could agree to. We've done that. Uh, and uh, we've demonstrated to Senator Manchin and others that even that slimmed down compromise version of the voting rights bill um, could not break through the filibuster. In fact, every Republican in the Senate um, uh, voted to, uh, con, you know, to to not allow not, not, not allowed to, to to move to to finish the debate so that you could have a vote on the substance of the bill. Um, that was extremely disappointing, but not surprising, given how polarized things are right now on the issue of voting rights. And by the way, really important part of this bill, in fact, to me right now, the most important part of the bill is a set of provisions we added to, to deal with what, what has come to be known as election subversion, an effort that we're seeing in states across the country um, that were close in the 2020 election by supporters of former President Trump to install election officials, secretaries of state and others who would be prepared to um, basically disregard the votes of the people in their state um, the next time uh, if President Trump runs for re-election in 2024 or, or runs to, to for a, a, a second term in 2024, election officials who would do what he ordered Republican election officials in Georgia, Arizona, and elsewhere to do in 2020. And that is to disregard what the people said and to certify him as the winner. Um, so we have provisions in this bill to guard the integrity of the vote against that kind of partisan interference in the future. Um, it was filibustered in the Senate. So our hope has been that that would be enough to convince Senator Manchin, at least, and Senator Sinema not to get rid of the filibuster because they would never do that, but to reform the filibuster so that it is at least possible for legislation like this to go through um, without, uh, without uh, the, the 60 votes that are necessary under the filibuster rules to pass it. 
I hope that happens. We're going to fight really hard to ensure that that happens. If it doesn't, well, I think that's an issue in a lot of Senate uh, elections around the country uh, in 2022. Um, and hopefully we have one or two more senators at least who are willing, at least for voting rights and civil rights, to allow uh, to, to change the rules to allow an up or down vote. Thanks so much. Thanks, Tom. All right, we are going to start uh, with some live questioning. Remember to please use the chat feature at the bottom of your screen to submit your question. I see a few people have their hands raised. So again, if you would like to ask your question, please first ask your question using the chat feature. And we just ask that you include your name and the town you are from as well. Great, to start, we have Jay from Roxbury. Jay, can you hear us? Jay, do we have yes. you? There you are. You hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. Hey, Jay. Uh, okay. So my concern is about the Postal Service. Um, last election, for the first time, I was afraid to put my vote in the mail because I, I was concerned that it just wouldn't get there for whatever reason. Uh, and also the rest of the mail just doesn't seem to get there in the, used to get there in a day, or maybe it took three. But now I have no faith in the service at all, and they keep raising the prices. And I don't understand why Mr. DeJoy gets to stay on. He seems to be disrupting uh, the process by moving it by truck rather than by plane. I don't expect the service to pay for itself. I'm, I want that service and I'm willing to pay what it costs to, to have it, but it has to be decent. Yeah. Um, so the interesting thing is that I, the service can pay for itself and has mostly paid for itself in recent years, except for one big problem. And that is a mandate that Congress for some reason imposed in the mid 2000s that the postal service pre-fund its pension obligations to its employees, I think through the year 2050 or something crazy like that, something no, you know, no major corporation in America does. And that more than anything else contributed to the fiscal crisis that the, the postal service found itself in. Um, we have legislation that among other things would eliminate that pre-funding mandate. Um, and you know it's it's actually bipartisan. It has not yet um, gone through the House and the Senate. It is very high on my list of things as we as we get through the crush of these two big bills that we've been discussing. It's very high on my list uh, to uh, to to encourage our our leadership, uh, Ms. Pelosi and Mr. Schumer, to to fast track because you know what you're raising, Jay. I'm hearing from constituents up and down my district. The election mail went fine, um, you know, and yeah. I know lots of people were worried about that. We focused really hard on making sure that that would work uh, in the 2020 election, and it did. I have confidence in this election, the one we're about to have in New Jersey, in that respect. Um, but that said, like a lot of regular mail, I'm, I'm hearing, you know, nightmare stories. And you know, it doesn't have to be the majority of mail can be fine if it's one or two percent. That, that, is, uh, that, that is held up uh, in, in ways that, that, that I think would have been unheard of 10 or 20 years ago, that, that, is, uh, that, that is a huge problem. I view the Postal Service as one of the foundational responsibilities of the United States government. It has been going back to the, to the start of our country. And yes, we're not all sending long form letters to our friends and postcards in the way that we used to, but we're actually relying on the postal service more than we used to for other things, um, to be that, uh, to deliver packages to our homes, for example. So much of uh, the American economy now depends on the postal service providing that service to some of the private companies that, uh, uh, that um, you know, are not actually doing end-to-end -end delivery that are relying on the Postal Service to do those last few miles. So uh, we got to get this right. We have not 
um, succeeded yet, uh, and I intend to make it a very high priority in the in the coming months. Thanks for raising. Thank it. you. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Jay. Next up, we have Stephen from Kenilworth. Stephen, can you hear us? Yes. Go ahead with your question. Yes. Hi, how are you? My name is Stephen. I'm from Kenilworth. Um, so I have two young boys. The first one was born in uh, December 2012, just before Hurricane Sandy. So oh, there's one of them. Hi. <laughs> so um, Hi. You know, the, the issue of climate and the, the world I'm going to meet for my kids is always at the forefront of my mind. As part of that, I, I bike to work every day from Kenilworth to Elizabeth. And people really think I'm, I'm crazy for it. And, and to be honest, they're, they're kind of right. It's dangerous. I actually, in July, I broke my collarbone when I got hit by a car on the way to the work. And, um, you know, it's scary. So for, for me, you know, I have an electric vehicle and I think it's a good thing, but I don't think it's the whole answer to our climate goals. And I was wondering, as part of the transportation bill, you know, I think more people need to bike and use micro mobility and walk. Um, what kind of infrastructure um, is going to be involved for, for bike infrastructure, micro mobility, walking? And also, what can I do personally, aside from bike to work, to try and help promote it more? Uh, great question. So uh, absolutely, there is funding in the infrastructure bill for exactly those kinds of things, um, for our municipalities and counties to invest in, uh, in bike lanes and micromobility in um, pedestrian walkways, greenways, uh, trails, all of that stuff can be funded. Um, will it be funded? is a question that's up to our local governments. Um, we, we, you know, the federal government provides the resources. We're not gonna force the town of Kenilworth to, uh, to spend it one way or another. We provide grants and opportunities should our municipalities um, make these kinds of things a priority. I think most of the, the, the towns I represent would make them a priority. There's a lot of interest among our mayors, our county officials, and exactly that kind of stuff. But I think one thing that you can do and everyone can do is as these resources become available, um, push your, your, your local elected officials, your, uh, your, your township committee people, your mayors uh, to, uh, uh, to apply for these grants and, and to incorporate um, uh, bike riding and pedestrian walkways uh, as much as possible into city planning. Um, great news is there'll just be more resources for that kind of stuff, but they got to make, they have to make those uh, decisions with your input. That's why the local elections and legis uh, state legislative elections are so important. I'm not going to plug any particular candidate or party, um, but I will certainly uh, encourage everybody on this call, uh, if you haven't already voted uh, early to, uh, to vote tomorrow and uh, in our state and local elections in, in the state of New Jersey. It's so important for, for, for this reason. Thank you. Thanks both. Next up, we have Anne from Springfield. Anne, can you hear us? Just asked you to unmute. Anne, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Go ahead with your question. Um, is family leave, it, it's been back and forth finally in the bill do you know it is probably not in the bill i'm sorry to say yeah. i i'm disappointed about that you know the, i've been talking about that as an effort to bring america into the 20th century because you know we're one of only you know a half dozen countries in the world that does not provide uh paid family and medical leave um a lot of uh a lot of my answers are going to come back to math in the United States Senate and to some extent in the House. Uh, you know, we've got a 50-50 House. Um, I'm sorry, 50-50 Senate right now. Uh, and on top of that, the filibuster rules and on top of that, the, the very arcane rules of budget reconciliation. And so we got to, you know, you have to respect math. And there are just some things we're not able to do that I might want to do. In this case, we had 49 senators. We needed 50 uh, and we didn't have Senator Manchin. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to not going to waste my time criticizing people uh, on this call. I'm just telling you the, the facts. But if that's where 
we ended up. Um, but um, my experience working with Senator Manchin is that it's a, everything is an ongoing conversation. <laughs> and um, he's sometimes swayed in different directions by different people that he talks to. And so we're certainly not gonna give up on that. And at the same time, I'm gonna be honest about my disappointments. I'm gonna be honest about uh, things that I'm not getting that I thought would be good for the American people and, and for my district, but I'm not going to allow my disappointment to um, take away from the fact that we are achieving a tremendous amount of good in these bills for the American people. I mean, if somebody had told me um, a couple of years ago that we'd be able to put policies in place that cut poverty in America by 46% and give every single one of my constituents with kids a tax cut, the biggest middle-class tax cut we've had in forever in America. I'd say, you know what, that'd be pretty good. Like if that's all we did over my next two years in Congress. Like that would be something I could be proud of. And oh, and by the way, the gateway tunnel and the salt deduction and all the other stuff I mentioned. And so, and we've done all that, right? And, 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 and so I'm, I, I, I think there's a lot here. Um, again, depending on your point of view, some, some folks may disagree with what we're doing, but if, if you like some of the things that I laid out, I, I hope that you would see this as a good day for American democracy. Um, the last half full, and then we come back and fight to fill it some more. That's, that's what life is about. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. Anne. Thanks, Tom. Let's go to Victor from Bridgewater. Victor, can you hear us? Victor from Bridgewater, do we have you? Yes, I hear you. Yes. Can I go start? Ahead. Yep, yes. go ahead with your question. Hello, Congressman, thank you for participating in this meeting. Um, I have a question about current status of cybersecurity in our country. Uh, since Mr. Biden took the office, you expressed hopes that our national efforts to fight cyber threats will expand. Unfortunately, the opposite has happened. Attacks became bolder and the cybersecurity budget, as far as I know, still insufficient, it's pretty small. Uh, so I would like to hear from you what is status of this issue. Thank yeah. you. So I, I, I agree with you in part. I do think that uh, our cybersecurity budget is still too small. We were just discussing that in my office, my staff. And I, um, I serve on the Homeland Security Committee, as you may know. We have a couple of hearings coming up that are going to um, drill down on, on this question. Um, I am very concerned, uh, as all of us should be, about cyber attacks on our critical infrastructure, uh, on uh, our uh, energy grid, on our water treatment facilities, for example. I, I was in a hearing a few months ago um, a committee hearing, we were, we were talking to people who run water treatment facilities in different parts of America, and there have been really serious attempted attacks. You can imagine what that could do to all of us if one of those attacks was successful. And I asked them if, you know, if A, are you prepared? And they said, no, they're not cybersecurity experts. And B, if, uh, if there is an attack on one of your facilities, are you required to report that? to the federal government? And the answer was no, they're not. So we don't even have necessarily a complete picture of, um, uh, of the attacks that have taken place, the attempted attacks, most of which fortunately still fail uh, on our critical infrastructure. So one thing that I'm gonna work on doing is making sure that uh, any local uh, uh, utility, uh, or entity that, that delivers critical services to us, like water and electricity, um, that, that they have to report these attacks as they, they happen. And of course, if you know, they pay a ransom, like we need to know that um, so that we understand the scope of the problem and what needs to be done. Yes, the budget needs to increase. Um, and then finally, and, and this is putting on my old foreign policy hat, uh, we, we, we do need to um, 
recognize a lot of these attacks, a lot of these ransomware attacks are coming from either uh, Russia or neighboring countries um, where the Russian government has a tremendous amount of influence. Uh, that's not to say that the Russian government is itself staging these attacks, but they certainly know about it. They could do something about it and they choose not to. And um, I have been uh, very clear with the Biden administration that they need to reestablish deterrence. They need to um, make it clear to the government of Russia that we would cons we consider attacks from territory that they control on um, private and public institutions in the United States um, to be uh, uh, in effect nation state attacks because if they can do something about it and choose not to, we, we would hold their government responsible and to make clear to them that we have offensive cyber capabilities as well. They can take something down here, we can take something down there. And my understanding is that message has been delivered. Um, a lot of this obviously is not in the public uh, domain. Um, and my hope is, and we will watch this carefully, that where necessary, we are, uh, we are hitting back in appropriate ways. Um, just again, to establish uh, you know, what we used to call in the nuclear era of the Cold War, good old fashioned deterrence. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks both. Let's go to Jeff from Warren. Jeff, can you hear us? I can. I just a second. Go ahead Tom, with the question. Tom, thank you for taking the, just getting rid of the video. Um, I had two questions. One was on, on climate change. And I think you've already addressed it. The second one, deals with the uh, House investigation of the January 6th insurrection, something that you mentioned. I was curious whether you can provide any update uh, on the status of, of that investigation. I know that we all are still, I know I am incredibly outraged that it happened, but particularly fearful going forward, given that over 70% of Republicans are buying into the big lie that the election was stolen. So I was curious whether there's any insight or update you can offer on that. Yeah, that's why it's important, you know? I mean, I'm. I, I, might, I, might, I might have been open to saying, you know, let's move on, as horrible as that event was, but um, the, the, the people behind it are not moving on. I mean, you see what's happening um, in the Republican caucus in the House of Representatives, where we've had a number of members who are very courageous in standing up to that nonsense, including very conservative Republicans like Liz Cheney, you know, disagrees with a lot of what, I, what I'm pushing for, um, but has uh, rock solid integrity. And, and basically every single one of them, every one of them who was on the right side of January 6th and who stood up to what the former president tried to do that day is being driven out of the party. Um, you mentioned the significant growing number of Americans since January 6th who, who believe in, in, in the lie that the election was uh, was stolen, um, and if you know if, if if that doesn't bother you, you know the same uh, propaganda machine that produces that lie is also responsible for the lies about the, the COVID vaccine that that have been killing between one and three thousand Americans every single day for the last few months, which is I, I almost don't have the words, certainly words that would be appropriate to use in the setting for that. Um, outrage. Um, and, and so, you know, the people who are behind January 6th are still at it. And they may not be massing rioters on the Capitol, but they are massing lobbyists and activists on state capitals around the country, as I mentioned, to, uh, to try to install compliant election officials who are promising to do what the, the, the you know, the, 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 the decent Republicans with integrity refused to do um, in uh, following the 2020 elections. So the, the threat is very, very real. And that's what makes the January 6th Commission very important. Um, it is fortunately a bipartisan committee, um, despite the uh, leadership on the other side in the House refusing to cooperate, thanks to 
uh, those courageous Republican members who chose to, to be part of it. Um, it has issued uh, subpoenas now uh, for a number of people with information about what happened and the planning of those events to appear. Uh, when some of those people refuse to appear, um, we have now issued uh, criminal referrals um, of contempt um, to make it clear that the Congress of the United States is serious and that you have to respect um, what we're trying to do here. And we had a vote on the House floor uh, on, on that, which was bipartisan. Um, uh, certainly not enough members on the other side joined us, but, but a few courageous ones did. And, uh, it, it, and that was, I think, a very good thing as well. So that's, that's the fight that's underway now. There's going to be a lot more hearings, uh, a lot more coming out. Uh, one issue I hope they're going to focus on, by the way, not just, not just looking at what happened, but in terms of the remedies, one issue I hope they're going to focus on is the role that social media played. Uh, in radicalizing people on, on that day. And, uh, and as many of you know, I've got a bill um, that's picking up a lot of support uh, to address that problem. We now have a, uh, a Senate uh, counterpart to my bill uh, introduced by Senator Ben Ray Lujan. So it's in both the House and the Senate. That's another thing I wanna turn my attention back to uh, once we're done with these, these two uh, big bills that we've been discussing on this call. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. All right, next up we have Dave. Dave, can you hear us? Dave uh, from Basking Ridge. Hi, yes, I, I can. Can you hear me? Yes, yes you can. Oh, great. Well, well, thanks for taking my question, Congressman. Uh, it's a pleasure to talk to you. Of uh, I, 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 I'm really concerned about inflation here. We, you know, we're seeing incredible inflation now. And uh, you know, you mentioned all these great programs, and and I I, I agree with you. I, I think they're very nice, uh, but but I'm very concerned that we're going to be unleashing tremendous inflation. Uh, President Biden's 18 economists have come out and said, no, no, we're not going to have any inflation, and I find that incredibly difficult to believe. But uh, I studied their uh, analysis a little bit, and. Uh, it, and it seems to be their argument is, well, if, if productivity increases with the government spending, then, then you would have a net net and just things grow and there is no inflation. Uh, I'm concerned, however, the, the uh, productivity will not grow at the same pace as, as your spending will. Uh, for example, it takes eight years to get a road approved. Uh, we're having trouble getting people back to work now. They're, everyone seems to be sitting home. Uh, watching TV, uh, and 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 if inflation does occur, it's it's really attacking the very people you're trying to help. These poor people that are deciding between a gallon of gasoline at five dollars or food for their kids. I think this is a really significant problem, and I don't believe a word of those eighteen economists. <laughs> uh, well, I. Um, I agree with you that we should not be complacent about this. It is a real problem and it would be a terrible mistake to be complacent. Um, I'm never gonna totally dismiss the work of 17 Nobel Prize winning economists. It's hard. But, but I would point out you know, on your side of the argument that there are economists on both sides of this question. Sure. Right. Um, which I guess means it's complicated. And it's sometimes hard to talk about complicated things in a political context. Um, here, here's my perspective on it. Uh, tr traditional inflation, you know, what we studied back in, in high school happens when, you know, you print too much money, right? There's too much money circulating, uh, which means demand goes up, but the supply of things stays the same. Exactly. And, is there a risk of that when we're spending this much money? Yes, I think the answer is yes. The, the best way to, the simplest way to try to manage that risk is to make sure that we're uh, paying for the things that we're doing. So we're not just printing money to do all that wonderful stuff that, that I mentioned, but we're also, um, we're raising revenue to pay for those things so that the net effect 
uh, on inflation is uh, is neutral, is is zero, and um, you know we're still you know we're still hammering out the details of this Build Back Better bill. We we need to get a final score, as they say, from the Congressional Budget Office, an estimate of uh, of how much these things are going to raise and cost. We know some of that, but maybe some things we still need more details on. But I do think, and I hope you would agree when you look at the revenue provisions of the bill, that they're not gimmicks, that they are, they are very, very serious. Whether you agree with them or not, from an inflationary point of view, they are very serious and they help manage against, uh, they help manage that risk. Um, number two, uh, I would say that what we're seeing, the inflation risk we're seeing right now is not chiefly that traditional risk of printing too much money. What we're seeing is, well, well, we started with a system um, that the private sector loved called just-in-time delivery, right? Where something, you know, uh, you order something uh, online and the algorithm has predicted that you are gonna order that piece of furniture and a factory in China produces it, you know, exactly on the day that it should so that when it ships, it gets to you exactly when you expect it without spending an extra day in the warehouse, right? And so we had that miraculous system and then we had a global pandemic which disrupted everything. People not going to work in the United States, just as important, people not going to work in factories all over the world, in Southeast Asia, in, in China, uh, in, in Latin America where these things are produced, um, people getting sick, um, people being told to stay home. And so all of these, uh, all of the supply gets disrupted, but something else happens that has almost never happened before in a crisis like that, the US government rose to the occasion to make sure that the American people still had money to spend, to make sure we weren't destitute, to make sure that if you were unemployed, you got unemployment insurance that was generous. Um, stimulus payments, all of the stuff that aid to small businesses that, that, that succeeded in saving almost all of our main street businesses in the little towns that we live in, in, in the state of New Jersey, so that those businesses could continue to order things, right? Um, all of that's really good, but what it meant is that supply was way down because of all these disruptions and demand us, we still wanted to buy things. And so the result of that supply demand, very simple, is number one, you know, stuff isn't available when we want it to be and prices go up. Um, so that's really bad. But the good side of that is, and I think most economists do agree, um, including a lot of the Nobel guys and gals, that that is temporary, that that is something that as we succeed in fighting COVID, not just in the United States, very importantly in other countries, that that does begin to work itself out. Um, while we hope for and work for that, we have also, I told you this was complicated, so I'm giving you the full answer. We've also got to make sure that for certain critical goods and materials, we are less dependent on foreign countries um, than we have been in the past. Um, I have a bipartisan bill, which I've just introduced, that will, uh, I believe, be taken up by the House when we, as part of a big China-related bill that we're going to be doing in both the House and the Senate. Um, uh, I'm partnering with Adam Kinzinger, Republican of Illinois, uh, to set up an office at the Commerce Department with a lot of money to invest in domestic supply chain in areas like microchips, um, which is a reason, right, disruption in the automobile industry. Um, also things that a lot of people haven't heard of, like uh, critical components of solar panels that are right now made almost entirely in China, often with slave labor. Like you want solar panels on your roof, but you got to then swallow that, that, that you have basically slave labor being used to produce the panels. Um, so that's, uh, that's another solution that we are pursuing. Obviously not for everything. I don't mind global trade, but for things that we, that are critical to our health, safety, and security, 
I want to make sure that we're producing those things in the United States. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thanks both. Let's go to Andrea from Union. Andrea, can you hear us? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, yes we I can. can. Hey, Andrea. Okay, great. Yes, I'm on the, I'm on the phone, so I wasn't sure. Um, good afternoon. Thank you for doing the, this uh, for us. Um, my question is oh, the same as always. Uh, does the bill include anything for student loan relief? Um, it it includes uh, that there are education provisions uh, related to Pell Grants, um, but it does not do a lot for student loan relief. Um, so that is another disappointment. Okay. okay. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you very much. Hopefully we can work on that in the future. We, we are going to. That is absolutely in the category of uh, cannot stop trying. Um, you and I have discussed this before, I think, and, and you know- Yes, we have. I am very, very much aware of the, the, the overwhelming burden that, um, that a lot of folks uh, experience here. And you know, I've told you I'm not for wiping out all the debt, but I, I, I think just as we're doing with healthcare costs and childcare costs, I think a, a good solution to this problem would be capping um, uh, uh, payments based on a person's income so that no, nobody is, uh, it, it, you know, no working person is rendered destitute because they happen to work in a, you know, in a low wage field. Thank you, Congressman. And, and I appreciate loans. that. Thank you. All right. Wish I had better news for now, but we'll keep it up. Thank you. Thanks, okay. Andrea. Next up, we have Joanne from Clark. Joanne, can you hear us? Joanne, do we have you? just asked you to unmute. Can you hear me now? Yes, we yes. can. Oh, Major. okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Congressman. Um, we were, I was on a, a Zoom call earlier this year and I asked you about the border mm -hmm. and we spoke a little bit about it, but it seems to be getting worse, Congressman. Yeah. And I'm concerned for so many different reasons financially, our economics, a burden on our economics right now. Who's coming in? Are we vetting them? I'm not even worried about COVID. I'm mm -hmm. worried about who are these people? And are they really coming in because they're trying to leave a suppressed country? So this is my question to you. Sure. Specifically, mm -hmm. Do you agree with open first? Do you agree with open borders? Do you think no. our borders should be open? No. Absolutely. Wide open. No. Okay, good. I'm so glad you said that. No. Now, what are we doing? What, what is the message this president, please, is sending? I, the Border Patrol people, you see it on TV. You don't even have to be a Republican or a Democrat. I saw this one picture, it broke my heart, where this mother obviously gave up. I, I still see it in the marshes, a six month old baby in a little bassinet alongside the three-year-old sister. Mm -hmm. This is what we're encouraging. So I, it here, takes my breath away. Yeah. Um, so let me, let me try to take that on. And I hope you forgive me if I say that this is also a complicated issue, right? That, that I think we need to see from, from, from different points of view. Um, and I'll start with just again, to repeat in case you have any doubts or anyone has any doubts, uh, I believe that the United States government, uh, as every government, has not just a right but an obligation to control our borders, right? We, we have a right to decide who can come to the United States and who cannot. That's, that's, a found, that's the basic place that I start from, and that we need sufficient rules, laws, and resources at the border to make sure that we have that kind of control. So that's number one. Um, number two, I'm gonna give you a number, which is both bad news and good news. And the number is that we've had, I think something like 1.7 million um, border, uh, um, actually that may not be, uh, the, the number of border apprehensions that we have had in the last year 
I, I may have uh, I, I may have forgotten the exact number, but it is the highest that it has been probably in decades. That is bad news, obviously, because it, it shows the crisis that you are seeing on TV. But it is good news in another way, in that it is showing that the enforcement system that we have is in fact catching most people who try to cross the border unlawfully. And the reason for that is that we have invested a lot of money in recent years in stuff that isn't sexy. It's not a border wall, which I actually don't think would work that well. It's in high technology sensors backed by border patrol um, that can detect anything moving across that border and that knows the difference between a human being and a deer or a rabbit or a phantom. Um, so we are actually apprehending the overwhelming majority of people who are trying to cross. Now, um, they are still trying to cross. And that speaks to something else that you asked about, like why are they coming? And here I would assure you, and, and I don't know what you're seeing on TV, there's a lot of stuff about immigration on the cable news and on the internet, but I, I can assure you that, that the overwhelming majority of people are trying to come because they are desperate where they are. Um, if you live in Haiti right now, you've experienced nothing but poverty and violence and earthquakes. And if you have a child and, and you're not trying to get that child to a better place, I mean, any of us as parents would be thinking about taking risks to do that. In Central America, in these countries where gang violence is a way of life, where if you have a 14, 15 year old son, the gangs are knocking on your door and they're telling you, we are taking your son. He's going to be a member of our gang. And if not, we are going to kill you. Imagine if you're a parent of a child in that situation. You would do almost anything. You would risk almost anything to get those kids to a better place. And so ultimately, although I believe, as I told you, we have to enforce things at the border, I don't think the solution to this problem is at the border. It is in these countries where we have to do what we can. We have to do more to try to create more secure environments for people where they can not you know, be rich, um, but, but at least have safe and secure lives for their kids. And we've got to have immigration reform inside the United States, where we already have millions of people who are living here, many of them for years, many for decades. They're part of our economy. They're not going to be sent home. President Trump even uh, didn't come close to, to sending home 10 million people. Um, we also have uh, as other people have mentioned on this call, we have economic disruptions, we have a labor shortage. We're about to create millions of new jobs, building infrastructure in America, and you know, we have to fill those jobs. And so what I wanna do, I wanna discourage illegal immigration at the border in the ways that I discussed, but I do also want to encourage legal immigration. People who wanna come here and have a better life for their kids, who want to become taxpayers, people who are already here, and I want them to be taxpayers. I want them, if they are law-abiding, if they pay a fine, I want them to be able to contribute to our economy without having to live in fear every single day. So that's what I hope we do. Um, I agree with you, we have a crisis at the border. I'm totally opposed to open borders. I want enforcement, but we should also treat people like human beings, and we should have more legal immigration to the United States. Thank you. Thanks both. And just a reminder, I see a few people have their hands raised. If you do have a question, please first ask it using the chat feature at the bottom of your screen. We will try our best to get through as many questions as possible. So please, to put yourself into the queue, please just ask that question in the chat feature along with your name and what town you are from. Next up, we have John from Hillsboro. John, can you hear us? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. Hey, John. Okay. Nice to talk to you again, Congressman. Uh, I'm calling in reference to, um, I'm a volunteer with the AARP, and our district has had a chance, <clears throat> excuse me, our group has had a chance to meet with you a number of times in the past. I call for two reasons. Number one, to say thank you for all the support you've given us each time we've asked. You've listened carefully 
You may not always agree, but you do a great job following up. And this time around, we're looking at the Medicare price uh, uh, prescription plan negotiations. Mm -hmm. I know it was in the Build Back Better bill, and now it's kind of been put on the back burner a little bit. I wanted to uh, check in and follow up with you. Thank you for the letter you sent to or co-signed for Nancy Pelosi. And we wanted to follow up and just see how it's going and what the next steps may be. Yeah, thank you, John. And first of all, just to fact check myself uh, on that immigration question, uh, it is actually 1.7 million apprehensions. Um, that number was in my head and then I doubted it, but, uh, but I just checked, and, uh, which is a lot. But again, it shows that we are catching people. Um, and then on, on, on the issue of drug pricing, uh, this, is, this is a hugely important issue. We all know that Americans pay a lot more for common prescription drugs than our counterparts in most other countries. It is not all of the, the it, it, it's not the only part of the problem of expensive healthcare in the United States, but it is certainly one big part of it. And for many years, we have been trying to do something very simple and I think very logical, and that is to allow Medicare to negotiate with the drug companies to get the price of these drugs down to a reasonable level. Um, there are, there, there's a new drug for Alzheimer's that was just approved by the FDA to give you just one example, um, which if every senior uh, in the Medicare system uh, who has experienced Alzheimer's, which is a very large number of our fellow Americans, if every one of them um, went to Medicare to pay for this drug, Medicare would go bankrupt just because of this one drug, because we have a company that can name its own price when it sells to us through the federal government, through Medicare. No other industry gets to name its own price. The defense industry doesn't get to name its own price when they sell fighter weapons to the defense department. There, there is a negotiation. Um, when I talk to constituents, this is probably the issue that most people agree on in my district. And we have a lot of wonderful pharmaceutical companies in New Jersey, including in my district. Um, but when I talk to Republicans, independents, Democrats, everybody agrees, like, this is a no brainer. We should do this. At the same time, um, the drug companies spend a huge amount of money trying to stop this from ever happening. Not just on the lobbyists, there are more drug company lobbyists in Washington than there are members of Congress um, on campaign contributions. This is one reason I took a pledge not to accept any contributions from corporate political action committees when I first got into this uh, uh, being a congressman business um, so that I can talk to them, but they can't influence me that way. But also they spend a tremendous amount of money on advertising against political candidates who stand up to them on this stuff. In our congressional district, in the last couple of months, there was a dark money group that is registered to a post office uh, in box in a strip mall in Virginia. That's all we know about them. That has spent over a million dollars in ads to all of you, to all of us, opposing this provision. You probably have seen the ads that say, call Tom Malinowski and tell him not to cut Medicare to pay for the $3.5 trillion bill. You see, who, who's seen those ads, right? We're gotten the mailers. <laughs> what they are talking about is allowing Medicare to negotiate, which they are lying to you is a way of cutting Medicare. You should be, I'm angry at this. I, I hope every single one of you is angry that they are lying to our seniors, trying to scare them into thinking that something that will lower the cost of their prescription drugs is about cutting Medicare. But that's what we're up against. And they're spending that money in congressional districts across the country. As a result, um, this proposal um, ran into opposition from a very small number of Democrats. Um, this time it was not Senator Manchin in the Senate, it was Senator Sinema. And all it takes is one because we need all 50. 
And so it is unsettled, I would say, in, in the bill. It's one of the last things that is being discussed in these final days. My guess is we will not get the full Medicare negotiation that we had uh, in the bill that passed the House. Um, but I also, I'm still hopeful that we're gonna get something that will get the cost of drugs down. Uh, and by the way, that will save, not cut Medicare, but save Medicare money, which it can then use to increase benefits. So we are already in the bill going to provide hearing benefits for seniors under Medicare. I think that's gonna be a huge improvement for a lot of folks. I'd like to add dental coverage and vision coverage as well. And, you know, the more we can save by getting the cost of prescriptions down, the more we'll be able to do to enhance benefits. So that's where we are. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thanks, John. Next up, we have Alpha from Nishanik Station. Alpha, can you hear us? I can hear you. Go ahead with your question. All right. So um, several times uh, you've said that you prefer uh, market solutions for addressing the current climate emergency that we're in. Uh, however, uh, market solutions like these often leave those who are in uh, disadvantaged situations and disadvantaged uh, communities most vulnerable. So uh, with policies that you support, uh, how are you going to prevent these people from being uh, further damaged by these policies? Um, so um, everything we are doing in this bill is going to be available to, to anybody, for example, who purchases a vehicle in, in, in the United States, it's going to make electric vehicles um, much more affordable, including for um, for people who, who have the least. Um, so I would, I, I, I don't think anything we're doing um, is anything other than helpful to people in disadvantaged communities. And on top of that, there are um, significant investments, including in the infrastructure bill, not big enough in my view, but still significant investments um, in communities, uh, in disadvantaged communities uh, in, in, in our country um, that have borne the brunt of uh, the wrong types of fossil fuel development. So for example, um, urban areas where highways have been built historically, and we now know from the historical record, were built deliberately to divide African-American communities um, from the economically, most economically productive parts of, uh, of, those, uh, of those cities. Um, money invested in these bills um, to, uh, to rebuild these communities in a much more equitable way. So the intention is there. There are resources there. Uh, I would not say that they are sufficient yet to deal with a problem. Um, but I think that's, a, that's not, that's not a, a drawback to the market-based solutions that we have in, in this legislation. It would certainly not be a reason, for example, against imposing a fee at the border on, um, on, on imported products that have significant carbon inputs, right? I mean, that, it's a very different issue. The problem is that we're, we're still not willing to invest enough uh, in some of those solutions in those communities. Um, one thing that we do, and I didn't mention uh, in this bill that's been raised on a lot of, um, uh, a lot of these uh, uh, calls uh, before is, uh, is, is to set up um, a, uh, uh, a, a, a basically a national uh, uh, climate conservation corps, um, which would uh, recruit young people in particular to work uh, in underserved um, communities to help them um, deal with uh, with the effects of climate change on their communities. So that's something, that's a big win in this bill in my view. Thanks Alpha and thanks Tom. Next up, we have Paul from Bridgewater. Paul, can you hear us? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can, yes, go ahead with your question. Uh, hi Tom, uh, pardon my appearance. I'm going through chemotherapy right now, so. Uh, oh, okay, I'm sorry to hear that. 
But thank you so much for joining. Yes. Uh, been a fun volunteer, huge supporter of you. Uh, my concern right now is that the Democrats are self-destructing a little bit as far as favorability rating. And the reason I see that happening is because of our inability to pass either piece of legislation in uh, Congress right now. I'm a big supporter of the reconciliation bill, but you know it's just going back and forth, back and forth. Um, I'm afraid we, we may lose Virginia because we haven't been able to accomplish anything. And is there any chance, even though we're all progressive here, to just pass the infrastructure bill with get a win of some sort so we can you know reverse the uh all the negativity that's been surrounding uh the democrats in congress recently uh is there any any possibility that you're you know you're considering that at all sure thank you so so first of all um uh we're i don't think we're all progressives or all democrats on this call and that's not the the point of of these sessions, um, I, I um, I'm always eager to hear folks come at me from every point of view. I've got people who are to the left of me and to the right of me, uh, and, and and that's what makes uh, this a, a a good healthy discussion. Um, I you know I, I'm not my, my first priority is not to focus on the politics of these things. Obviously, I'm a politician. I run for re-election and. I'd like to have a good record to run on when, when it comes time to, to do that. But right now, what, what is driving me is making sure that we deliver good things to the American people and to the people I represent in, in our district. Um, and I know folks are frustrated because they see how the sausage is being made. I tell them this is the way the sausage was always made. It's always taken uh, throughout American history. If you look at legislation, um, big important issues that Congress has passed uh, going back to the 19th century. It, it, there often takes weeks, months, even years to go through the process. And so if we get something done this week or next week, it's actually pretty fast by most historical standards. Uh, and then we get to talk about what we did. And, and then it's up to you guys, it's up to my constituents to decide whether they like what we did or not. Um, I think they will because uh, you know I heard a lot from folks about uh, doing something on the salt deduction and the gateway tunnel and healthcare costs and middle class taxes and the environment and all the stuff that we're acting on, but it it will be up to them and the chips will fall where they may. Uh, you asked specifically if we can just pass the infrastructure bill, whether the other one is ready or not. I hope the answer is yes. I have registered my view on that uh, for the last month. I've said we should just pass the darn infrastructure bill. Um, as soon as it's ready, it is ready. So let's do it. Uh, and I can tell you, we will do it the moment we know we have the votes to do it. Um, we don't want to put it on, put it to a vote and not have the votes to pass it. I want to send that to the president, get it signed, get people to work on these projects as quickly as possible. So uh, it could be. Um, you know, the earliest it could happen is tomorrow. My fingers are crossed. Um, we need to make sure that everybody in the house is ready. Uh, and, you know, that, that would be my preference. And I don't think, it, yeah, and I, I think if we did that, I don't think it would slow us down on the other bill at this point. Thank Thanks, you, Paul. Paul. Thanks, Paul. Thank Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Tom. All right, we are going to take just one more question, one more live question, seems like we have time for, and that is uh, with Veronica from Long Valley. Veronica, can you hear us? I just unmuted you, try that again. There you okay. go. Okay, you got me? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Okay, thank you so much for taking this. Okay, I'm a little nervous. I'm actually, actually very nervous um, because I'll be very honest up front. I am very seriously considering running as an independent against you. 
next year in Congressional District 7. I worked for you in 2018 very hard. I knocked on hundreds of doors for you. Uh, but today I got my um, ACA renewal premium bill and my premium went from $2,300 a month to over $2,600 a month. And even if I do qualify for the subsidies, my premium will still go up $300 a month. It's a 12% increase that these insurance companies are getting. Now, nine out of 10 people cannot afford the ACA. It's, it's a failure, it really is. And I know you say that there are subsidies, but the taxpayers pay the subsidies. That's where the money comes from. It comes from the taxpayers. Um, so the, the, the insurers are getting their full premiums one way or another, whether, whether it comes out of my check that I write for my premium or whether it comes out of my taxes. And that's only for premiums. What you don't include in that 8.5% is our deductibles, our co-pays, what's out of network, and also one in five in network claims are denied. Um, so by the time you add everything up and add in what we're paying in all our property taxes, every town has millions, in some cases, tens of millions of dollars in private health insurance premiums. We pay our cops who opt out $4,000 and our teachers who opt out 13,000, we are actually paying public employees not to have insurance. It's, it's crazy. You said a little while ago, respect the math. You're a Rhodes Scholar. You probably be the smartest person in the room. You're 10 times smarter than me. I only have a high school education and I know the math. And when you look at independent, multiple uh, Democrat, independent Republican studies, Medicare for all is favored by people and it would take four to 6% of our adjusted gross income and eliminate the deductibles of the co-pays or at least make them more manageable. If this goes on, my premiums are gonna be over $31,000 and I cannot do that. And like, um, and just like the majority of the American people and you still don't support uh, Medicare for all. And um, just like the majority of the Americans want Medicare for all, they also want this pharma uh, to be, uh, Medicare to negotiate with pharma and that would, that's the one provision in the bill that would save taxpayers a lot of money. So why can't the overwhelming majority of Democrats who want this get on those who won't? Because it just goes, it just proves and reinforces that the healthcare industry is in charge of our Congress. Not, and not just healthcare, it's fossil fuel. And I know I'm, I brought that pledge to your office and you did sign it and turn it around about campaign finance reform. And you do not take super PAC money, but you do take House majority forward uh, like their ads and Democrats for the last two years have taken more dark money than Republicans. So my question to get to my question to you is what service do these insurance companies provide? There's no product. They don't deliver the healthcare. They don't do x-rays. They don't do labs. They don't see patients. They don't provide any product. Their service is to, to negotiate prices, which they're horrific at. And I can get an MRI cheaper through by paying cash than I do by using my insurance because I have to go through my deductible and my copay and my co-insurance. Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield in New Jersey are our largest employer made 13 billion in revenue in 2019. And they paid out seven, they, they paid 73.5 million claims. Now that's the amount of claims that they paid. That's not the money that they paid for the claims. I cannot find that information, but if you, if you say they paid a million dollars for each of those 73 mil, million claims, 73 million is nothing compared to 13 billion because I know the difference between a million and a billion and it's staggering. It's almost unfathomable. So again, Tom, you're so smart. You say respect the math, you say be honest. Why are you not on board with this? And why are you not fighting harder for this? I really feel like I worked hard for you and you're failing us. I cannot sustain this. I'm thinking about, my husband and I are gonna talk again. Do we not have insurance? What, what do we do? Uh, it, it's it's inexcusable that Democrats are not getting that pharma through, and it's inexcusable that we that they have this hold on us. And you got to do more. I honest to God, I'm thinking about running against you. I fought for you, but I'm thinking about running against you. That's <laughs> that's okay. I'm not gonna. That, that's okay. Anybody can run against me. Uh, and 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 look, I. 
I really welcome anybody who comes to a forum like this and takes issue with me. Um, I think sometimes we agree with each other too much. And, and so I wanna thank you for, for holding me accountable, for presenting a different point of view. And we agree on some of this stuff, obviously, on, on the pharma stuff. You know, even though I represent a district in which that is the most powerful industry, I've taken a stand for, for Medicare negotiation. I think it's the right thing to do. Um, we talked about the difficulties that we've had there and, and the overwhelming majority of Democrats in Congress support it. All it takes is one in the Senate to oppose it. And it's not like we haven't tried to persuade that person because um, it's really, really important to a lot of us. It's also, as I mentioned, it would be a great way for Medicare to save money that it could then reinvest in other benefits that a lot of our seniors are, are demanding. So that's a no brainer. You know exactly why we have the problem that, that we do. Um, on Medicare for all, I think you and I have discussed this and you know, you ask what service our insurance companies provide. I have to talk to, I have to listen to all my constituents. And I have a, I have a lot of constituents who agree with you that we should scrap the current system entirely. I have a lot of others who don't, who, who, um, who have private insurance, who think that, um, that either it is a good system for them now, or that scrapping it entirely would be too disruptive. I know you passionately disagree with that. But I do have to listen to everybody when I try to represent the voters of this district. And, and you want to continue to come at me on that? That's totally, that's fine. That's the way, that's democracy. That's the way the system is supposed to work. And in terms of what you're experiencing, um, we're not going to be able to do all the math, of course, you and I together in front of an audience. But um, I am concerned when I hear somebody say that their ACA uh, premiums are going up at a time when we pass legislation designed to produce just the opposite effect. So um, if you haven't already, I'd, I'd like to know just so that we can be smarter, maybe we can help, but also just so we can be smarter in my office. I'd like to know what's going on in your individual case if you haven't shared that with my team already. But the bottom line of what we have done since uh, this spring um, is to set up a system through getcoverednewjersey.com, right? Our, our state exchange is run by the state um, where folks who didn't qualify for the subsidies before would qualify to keep them under that 8.5%. And yeah, I know that doesn't cover surprise billing. There are a lot of other problems in the system, um, but I am concerned to hear that some of these premiums are going up um, unless there's some significant change in your health and situation that might explain that. Um, I'd like to know more about why that's happening, if that's okay. All right. Absolutely. Thanks, Thanks. for the question. Thanks, Veronica. Right. I believe we do have your contact information, so we will absolutely be in contact with you in the coming days as well. And thank you everyone for being on this call today. We really, really appreciate all your thoughtful questions. I know there was a lot of questions that we weren't able to get to. So if we weren't able to get to one of your questions, please visit the link that I just dropped in the chat feature. That's malinowski.house.gov slash contact, or you can go to that exact same site and add slash send dash me dash an email. Um, we are always taking your feedback and we'll do our best to respond as well. We are, again, we're nearing the end of this call, so I'm gonna turn it over to the Congressman for closing remarks. Take it away, Tom. Thank, thank you, Nari. Thank you everybody so much for, for participating, for the excellent questions as always. I, have, I always get a lot out of um, these sessions as I've, uh, I think I say at the end of every one of them, uh, I, I get my priorities from you. Uh, even, if we, even if we may disagree on what a solution might be, which is inevitable, when a bunch of smart people get in a room together. Um, what, what I do get from all of you is what my priorities need to be, what issues I should be focused on, what problems I need to uh, try to solve. And, uh, and today was, was no different from, from past sessions in, in helping me focus my attention in coming days and, and coming months uh, on, on the work that needs to be done for the, the folks that, that I represent. So 
we're gonna we're gonna keep on doing these sessions, and uh, I hope that you keep on coming. I, I hope that you help us recruit other folks uh, to join. Uh, sometimes we'll do them on Zoom. Sometimes we'll we'll do them live. Hopefully, as the COVID situation continues to get better in in New Jersey, uh, and and I hope that you know you you get word out to everybody who. Uh, wants to know what we're doing in Washington or just wants to hold their member of Congress accountable that um, that I, I, I want to hear their questions and their and their comments and and do the best I can to, to answer their concerns. So with that, um, until next time, uh, hope everybody stays healthy and safe and uh, and thank you again for spending this time with me.